What I'd like to do, if you guys don't mind, is to put everything into a deeper context by reviewing um, the automobile exception to the warrant requirement and tracing its history from 1925 up through the year 2000 when things really started to kind of uh, spin out of control in New Jersey. As I indicated a moment ago, it's important you understand this because it'll allow you to see the trend that's going forward in the case law and understand some of these major changes that took place uh, in the implementation of the automobile exception in, under New Jersey Fourth Amendment jurisprudence over the last 12 months. Uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the, this exception of the warrant requirement was created by our Supreme Court back in 1925 in the landmark decision of Carroll versus the United States. Bill, can you talk about that for about two seconds? Yeah, Carroll's a simple enough case. The police um, suspected the Carroll boys of bootlegging, and one night they see them driving on the highway that would take them from hither to yon, which would be part of their normal run. Um, and so they pull them over and, and they search. And the question, of course, was whether that, whether that search, and eventually they find um, alcohol in the car, was appropriate or not. They had no warrant for, for stopping the Carroll boys, and the court had to deal for the first time with that issue and decided that um, dealing with automobiles, the police needed to have the ability to make a search without a warrant in those limited circumstances. They couldn't arrest the Carroll boys because until they found the alcohol, they had no grounds for arresting. So the court created the automobile exception, which was based upon the existence of probable cause, which they did have, and the the exigency of dealing with a motor vehicle. And what the court said in Carroll was, if the police had to go and get a warrant, the Carroll boys, since we're not under arrest at the time, being clever people, would simply get in the car and drive it away. And by the time the police came back with a warrant, there would be nothing for them to search. So in order to prevent that problem, the court said, if you have probable cause, an exigency created from a having a mobile motor vehicle, you can search without a warrant. So that was the beginning. Over the years, uh, the Supreme Court adopted additional justifications for the automobile exception. And you all know these from law school, that automobiles are, the operation of an automobile is a pervasively regulated industry, so people have a lessened expectation of privacy. They have a lessened expectation of privacy in their automobile as compared to your home. And that's another justification for um, kind of a looser way of treating searches of automobiles. But it's really the, uh, the ability of people to drive their cars away, the inherent mobility of motor vehicles, that was really the, the kind of the, the, the linchpin of the necessity for this exception to the warrant requirement. Now, things were moving along very swimmingly until around 1996 with the decision in Pennsylvania versus LeBron, which was a major change in law. Bill, can you tell everybody about Pennsylvania versus LeBron? Yeah, again, this is, this is a very simple case in which the in which the police had probable cause, car. And the question was, did you need more in the federal system than merely the fact that the car is mobile? That is, did you really need some exigency, some circumstances that justified searching the car without the necessity of getting a warrant first? And the United States Supreme Court looked at it and said, no, if it's a car, and you got probable cause, that's good enough. And they simplified the rule, they eliminated, in effect, exigency meaning anything other than the fact that the car was mobile. So in the federal system to this very minute, if you have probable cause and a car, you can automatically search it without a warrant. No warrant is necessary. That's all the thinking that has to be done in that regard. And you know, this concept of thinking is very important because it's been the policy of the United States Supreme Court when dealing with police to basically say, look, police need easy to understand, simple instructions in terms of what the law is so they can implement it. Not because police are you know, not educated, intelligent people, then clearly they are but they're making decisions and having to take very significant legal actions under the stress and excitement of uh, people who are physically resisting them and chases and all kinds of pressures that don't exist in the courtroom. 
So the United States Supreme Court, and to a certain extent the New Jersey Supreme Court, has kind of always had this philosophy that statements of law have to be kind of really simple so that line police officers will have no difficulty in implementing them out on the street. There can't be anything easier than if you have probable cause, you can search the motor vehicle. Very simple, and that's what the law is federally. Of course, as you all know, um, under our system of federalism, individual states can provide more protection under their own state constitutions than you would normally be entitled to under the United States Constitution. In that sense, the United States Constitution constitutes a floor as opposed to a ceiling. It's the minimum amount of rights that you can get. And in New Jersey, we frequently, in Fourth Amendment jurisprudence, uh, under Article 1, Paragraph 7 our, of our state constitution, provide enhanced protections under our own, our own state constitution. Now, this issue came before our court in uh, 2000 in the Cook case, decision written by, um, by Justice Venero. And it's very important you understand that when the court is interpreting the New Jersey Constitution and saying our Constitution provides enhanced protections, this is an interpretation that you just can't change overnight. I mean, it would take an amendment to the Constitution in order to change what this interpretation is. Because if the court didn't lock these things in in concrete, then our, our Constitution would have no meaning. It could just be changed at, at, at a whim by a new body of justices who would uh, come on and have some other type of a political agenda in terms of interpreting the court. So once our court makes a determination of the meaning of a particular passage in the Constitution, they and everybody else are locked into that in perpetuity until such time as the Constitution uh, gets amended. Well, so you can't stop the United States Supreme Court from doing that with the federal Constitution. True, but the, in the, the state, it's a little it's a little bit different here because um, it just when well, the court says this is what it means, that's what it means. Now, for them to come back and say, "Oh, we were wrong," that would kind of undercut the the whole power of our our Constitution. So let's start off and talk about what uh, the ruling was by Justice uh, Venero and Cook. We emphasize that there is a constitutional preference for a warrant issued by a neutral judicial officer supported by probable cause. The cautionary procedure of procuring a warrant ensures that there is a reasonable basis for the search and that the police intrusion will be reasonably confined in scope. The exception, the automobile exception, applies only in cases in which probable cause and exigent circumstances are evident making it impracticable for the police to obtain a warrant. So the New Jersey Supreme Court at this point interprets Article 1, Paragraph 7 to provide enhanced protection more so than you would get under the, the Fourth Amendment. That we are going to remain and stay with the original rule in our state that um, the automobile exception to the warrant requirement requires proof of two elements. Number one, probable cause. And number two, exigent circumstances making it impractical for the police to get a warrant. All right? So far, so good? That's the law in our state, very simply put. Now, I'm going to tell you that for the first six years following this opinion by Justice Venero, there were no problems. Everything was okay. And you know why everything was okay? Because every time there was a, a case that came up where the issue of exigent circumstances was litigated, the state always won. The appellate division, which they never got higher than the appellate division, always held that there were exigent circumstances. Uh, a good example of this, actually there are two good examples of it, but the best one I can think of is a case called State versus Ireland, I-R-E-L-A-N. Uh, but when you read over the Ireland case, this is the uh, prototypical exigent circumstances case where the uh, appellate division talked about all the factors that were confronting the police. The fact that a confederate was there, had left, could have returned to the scene and, you know, fooled around with the car, taking contraband out of the vehicle, that it was hard for the police to get back up because of traffic accidents uh, in, the, in the vicinity that they had been assigned to, the traffic conditions and roadblocks, and all kinds of reasons why the police had sufficient exigency at the scene to conduct their search right there on the spot, uh, as opposed to getting a, uh, a warrant. Uh, and the Ireland case is pretty typical of the cases that came out during that time period. I researched and I could not find any case during that six-year period uh, where the challenge to, um, on the basis of, to the automobile exception on the basis of lack of exigency was sustained by any court of appellate authority. I'm not even sure it was sustained by a trial court, actually. So it seemed to be like a pretty dead issue, like the, uh, the courts were just going to look at a minimal amount of exigency and say that that was appropriate. All of this changed very, very abruptly um, in the case of State versus Dunlap, a case that was published, I think it was published companion to the uh, landmark decision in uh, State versus Eckel. 
In the Dunlap case, the background is very simple. A young woman uh, got herself uh, kind of tangled up with the police and as part of her negotiation to get out of her troubles, um, indicated that her boyfriend uh, was a, uh, a very active drug uh, dealer. And not only would he possess guns, but also uh, dangerous firearms. So the police worked with her to kind of set this guy up and had her make a phone call, uh, luring him to come to a particular location at a particular time. Once he agreed to do this, the police set themselves up with some kind of like a quasi-SWAT team, uh, posting approximately 10 officers, depending on whose version of the facts you believe, uh, to wait for this individual. The individual who uh, showed up at the time, the police pounced on him, yanked him out of the car, and uh, searched his vehicle. Inside of the vehicle, they recovered the drugs and guns that they were looking for. So, when the matter came before the Supreme Court, here was the issue. Number one, did the police have probable cause? Absolutely. They had sufficient, reliable evidence uh, that would indicate, gave them a well-grounded suspicion that this individual would have contraband in its vehicle in, in the form of illegal drugs and these firearms. The issue in the case then became, okay, well, you have uh, uh, probable cause. What about the exigent circumstances which are necessary when you're going to do this type of a search?